Hello, my beautiful tipsters. It's Melissa. This is a little intro I asked Matt to add on to the beginning of the episode because this was supposed to be out last week, but I got a new computer the week before and I am woefully terrible at technological things. So I didn't hook things up correctly and the only microphones were uh, on the computer. So as opposed to the microphones Joshua and I use that are high tech, high classy professional microphones that Mark Humphreys, you know, insisted we use, but I screwed up. So Matt tried to, in my words, polish the turd the best that he could. Sometimes when you're polishing a turd, it's just going to remain a turd. And Matt is literally the maestro of making everything better, but even he couldn't fix this. So I debated on whether to release it, but a lot of podcasts sound pretty awful. And I've just prided myself on being one of those people that mine did not. But here we go. So I think the episode is a good episode if you can get past the audio. And I promise there'll be another episode coming this week. Thank you for your patience with me. I'm trying. That's that's all I can say. I'm doing the best I can. From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, this is a Headache Soul production. Welcome to Just the Tipsters, America's favorite true crime podcast. And I'm your host, not one of Nick Cannon's baby mods. <laughs> Are you sure? I am. I am barren and nothing has been deposited uh-huh. inside of me by Nick Cannon okay. or outside of me or around me or near me. I didn't sit in a puddle. Uh-huh. Nothing. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh boy. I'm just kidding. I'm your host, Melissa uh-huh. Morgan. And this is my beautiful and talented co-host, Joshua Bevan. Say hello. Hey yo. Hey yo. Okay, now you sound like um Ed McMahon. Yeah. Joshua brought me pumpkin muffins that he oh. made. I can't believe how blessed I am. I have pumpkin muffins and you people don't. But anyway, <laughs> I have to say a special thank you to tipsters Jennifer and Emily for coming to my defense after last week's crappy email. I mentioned it, and they're the sweetest girls. They said they would um, put a hurting on uh, on the young girl who wrote me the nasty email oh. saying I was terrible. Wow. Um, Jennifer actually even said that she would get the tipster army together. And I'm like, baby doll, there's like seven people, and you're one of them. So, <laughs> And you're not taking a swing. At a... Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. It was very sweet. Um, I think Emily said she was mentally disturbed, something else. And then she said something about I'm one of the more – well, she said something really nice, like I'm one of the most caring people on the planet. I'm like, I'm not really. But um, it's true. Mm-hmm. I just feel like this young lady is, you know, misguided and she's hurting mm-hmm. and she was striking out at me. And if she thinks about like, she's like, I don't know why my friend's story is your content. If she thinks right. about it and I cannot change her mind, but there are so many great podcasts that do wonderful things. I hate covering missing persons. I hate it. But there are great podcasts who have actually made a difference. Absolutely. Who have found, you know, missing people, no matter what the outcome, maybe they walked away from their lives or maybe they, you know, something terrible happened or they were kidnapped or whatever, but they have made a difference and found people. And I just, I hope that one day she can look back, you know, and see that. And, um, tipster Jennifer reminded me that she herself had been a guest on the podcast a few years ago. And she was talking to me about her best friend in Texas who was just, you know, senselessly murdered as like a 16 year old girl. And she said, Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like my friend's story was, you know, being exploited. And that made me feel better. I think, I think that's where it is. I I think she's, she's hurting. Yeah. And I'm the target right in front of her, which is weird because Dane's mom goes on, Mm -hmm. you know, news shows, but is just won't go on podcasts really, but she was very, open to me. And I was like, I'm covering his case. You don't have to come on, but I'm going to talk about it. And she said, thank you for sharing my son's story. But her, you know, his friend. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to put that away, but I'm going to say that um, Jennifer and I had a very fun discussion this week. And Jennifer said she loves the dynamic between the two of us. She's like, I like your Joshua. (laughs) I'm like mine. He's mine. (laughs) She said, I love the dynamic between you two. And she said, I love how you give each other shit. And don't let each other get away with anything. And then she said, sometimes Joshua is a himbo, 
which made me laugh my fucking ass off. A himbo? Yeah, like a, like a bimbo, but you're a Oh, a himbo. himbo. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And no I go, argument. I go, yeah, he's totally abrosive, <laughs> is what I said. Uh-huh. But himbo is my favorite. Okay. Yeah. So now you're my little himbo. All right. <laughs> Like, yeah, okay. I'll, You're I'll that. that sure. was funny. She was the, the point she was making is last week when I said, you might remember the story and you go, no. And I go about the guy who's abandoned his Tesla and you go, oh yeah. Oh, yeah <laughs> you would let me fucking finish a sentence. <laughs> fucking himbo. <laughs> I love that this is cracking you up and it made oh, her laugh oh, too, oh, but she, okay. but she loves you. She oh, loves you even I though you're a himbo. Too. Uh, uh, she's she's I very beautiful, it. but she's married, so hands off. All right, okay. She's yeah, and she lives in Boston. So, uh, but I didn't get away unscathed either. <laughs> okay. Uh, I what, said what one of the else? things I love most about Joshua is that I've seen him cry, oh. and she goes, "Nobody cries more than you." <laughs> she goes, "I have seen weeping Jesus pictures that cry oh, less than you," and oh, I was no. like, "Thanks, thanks, Jennifer." Thanks, uh-huh. Jennifer. Uh-huh. She thought I should get a um, a portrait done called Weeping Melissa, uh, like, like on, c- commissioned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I told her I, I would save up for that. I think the lesson here is that Jennifer is a savage. I, I'm gathering. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's a savage. I mean, yeah. she would come to my defense if, you know, somebody was kind of a toad. Sure. I but mean, she called, you know, Joshua Hembo and she said, I need a, a weeping Melissa portrait made. <laughs> and I mean, she's not wrong on either I, account, right? You know, no, I can't I'm argue with her. Yeah, yeah I can't argue with her. I know you can't either. Yeah. But yeah, so. Love you, Jennifer. Thank you. <laughs> I really do love her. And I have met her. Uh, oh, yeah. In 2019, I was in Boston uh, with Mark and he had a work trip and I got to meet Jennifer in person. Sweet. And it was a joy. She is a joyous human being. So she's like literally one of the smartest. She's so fucking smart. By the way, she married a much younger man. That is smart. Yeah. No. She <laughs> she said she'd wondered if, you know, we were fucking. And I was like, we're not fucking. <laughs> As Joshua makes notes. Yeah. What, you, <laughs> what notes are you making? We are not, we are fucking. not fucking. Okay. Today. <laughs> Today. The day is young. <laughs> I was I was notating. Did like, you need a she... highlighter? <laughs> <laughs> I have a highlighter. If you need... You're, what were you notating? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, just to remember. Yeah, <laughs> not to not to not today. Fuck Melissa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I bent over, and the next thing I know, <laughs> you're Nick Cannon. <laughs> You are the Santa Clarita Nick Cannon. <laughs> Stop spreading your seed everywhere. Listen, I only have three. Have <laughs> that you know of. Yeah. By the way, they are beautiful. Thank you. Man, Joshua's boys are beautiful boys. So I did have an exciting week. Tell me. Uh, even though I'm at, you know, my wonderful job that is difficult and stress filled, but whatever. I, uh, I never look at my phone. We're not supposed mm-hmm. to look at our phones, but, you know. Occasionally I sneak a look, but we get two breaks oh. plus lunch. And, um, so you're going to take up smoking or, oh my God. And hang out like by the men's room and just smoke. I might, yeah. I might. Is there really a group of, no, it's a beautiful building. It's there on Smythe drive. It's like a bunch oh. of fancy people. Okay. Yeah. It's just fancy. And then and the office is beautiful. It's just super weird anyway so i go outside i typically go outside and take a walk or i go sit in my car smart yeah and take my phone and look so i I was like i need a break so i leave it you know we can take them anytime we want or not and sometimes we're busy we don't but i took my break at like 11 15 and at uh 11 01 i'd gotten a text and i didn't know because my phone's turned off and it was from a detective okay who said i have questions and i'm like who the fuck has questions for me you're a professional murder cop so he is a really interesting dude uh and this is about randy sellers um which josh was like who the fuck's randy sellers Mm -hmm. i have covered randy's case three or four different episodes and it's a case that's close to my heart because he's from kentucky he went missing in 1980 all likelihood killed by some cops uh Mm -hmm. who were you know sent to pick him up from uh the county fair uh, because they said he was drunk and disorderly. He wasn't drunk. He may have had some prescription meds and Mm -hmm. he was 17. Uh I know a juvenile in their custody who never makes it home. Nope. 
So um, this detective who is, it's, it's a long layered hillbilly story. The Kenton County police were in charge of his case for many years and that's where it happened. And I believe they kind of protected their own. The Kentucky state police are now the lead in the case, but Kenton County is not being very cooperative, like at all. Hmm. Super weird. I don't know how they can't be, but they're not. Hmm. So this detective with the Kentucky state police had been in charge of Randy's case a few years ago. And then he left and went to the private sector for a year and like security came back a few months ago to Kentucky state police. And I get a text, you know, a couple months ago, Hey, I'm back. Here's my new number. I'm like, you know, new phone, who dis? <laughs> and he's like, detective blank, blank. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Hey, they couldn't keep you away. You're like Michael Corleone. Cool. They just bring you back in. Right. Sure. And he is a good, smart, young man. And I'm really hoping we had a, we talked my entire break. I was even late coming back. Cause I wasn't going to not finish this sure. conversation. And I'm like, what kind of questions do you have for me? And he goes, uh, how old were you in 1978? Did you go to Twin Hoffel Junior High? And I'm like, I did. And the thing is, Randy was two years older than me and I didn't know him. Oh. Uh, we ran in very different crowds. He hung out in the smoking area and I was a priss ass. Mm-hmm. Is that hard for you to picture? It's not at all <laughs> difficult. <laughs> I, I, I believe you 100%. I pretended there was no smoking area. I would walk by like, no, that's where bad people <laughs> Um, So yeah, he was, we ran in different crowds. He was a little bit of a tough, but I mean, a good, a good kid, just, you know, sure. a teenage boy yeah, probably possessed exactly. by too many hormones. And he was very handsome, not my type, but very handsome to most everyone else. So you didn't know him I did not. at all. Okay. I, and here's the thing that's so fascinating. It's 1980. I'm 15. He's 17. I didn't know about the case. And we lived approximately five miles from each other. Remember, you're very young, sir. So you don't know that, you know, when there wasn't a 24 hour news cycle. The news was 7 p.m. on your TV. There were three channels, ABC, NBC and and CBS Mm -hmm. and what now becomes the Fox channel, but the local you know, right. local channel in Cincinnati. So you watch the news at seven and if you miss it, you miss it. Right. And I have a feeling I could be wrong, but I think my mom probably protected me. Like hit it from yeah. The so I didn't know. So here I am a couple years later, a couple years ago, two people from high school say, Hey, uh, we have your, within two weeks of each other, which is super weird. They didn't know each other. You know, have you thought about covering Randy Sellers case? I'm like, who the fuck's Randy Sellers? So I start looking, I'm like, holy fuck, this is fascinating. And the more I dug, it's it's really layered. One day when you're bored shitless, I'm going to give you the name, the numbers of the episodes and I want you to listen because okay. okay. it it progresses in a way that's, you know, I, I interviewed the original detective who had his case with Kenton County mm-hmm. and I thought that he was playing fair and he was totally a salesman selling He was a company man who, by the way, is now no longer in law enforcement. Yeah. It was like, you know, it just was a weird thing that I bought in hook, line and sinker because I am gullible. Wow. Yeah. So since then, some more things have come out. So there's two cops left who there were four cops apparently involved. Two of them have passed away. There's two cops left. They're getting old. 42 years later. And they're still on the force or they're retired? No, they're retired. retired. One of them lives in Kentucky. One of them lives in Chicago. I've named them both. So this detective says, um, what do you think about this? What do you think about I'm like, why is he asking my opinion? I know. It was so, it was overwhelming. I was trying not to cry. And then I kind of got upset and I go, somebody needs to fucking interview those two last cops. And he goes, I've talked to Bobby, the one in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And I go, what'd you get? And he goes, nothing. But I said, somebody needs to go to Chicago and interview that fucker. And he goes, well, it's going to happen. And I'm like, oh, so I have some hope here. I have some hope that Randy's case. I mean, I don't know how easy it's going to be. And he said, I think he's going to slam the door in my face. And that might very well be true. Sure. But I mean, I ca- I called the guy and emailed the guy and he finally answered me and he and he said, "I'm so sorry, I didn't see your message. I don't check this account. It would have been like three weeks." And then mm-hmm. he goes, uh, "I have no comment." Thank well, you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if he would be a little more open 
to people in law enforcement so, or so, more yeah. closed. Yeah. I also feel like these men are getting older and maybe they. Oh, we can maybe. Yeah. Need want, to get something off mm-hmm. their chest. Sure. That's what we can hope. Hmm. So that's the update. Um, I didn't mean to talk that long, but I did. So this case is pretty interesting to me. Okay. And woe be me who does a case like this. Because I think I've only done one that was covered on, you know, by an outlet that just does it magnificently, which is, you know, Unsolved Mysteries. The new Unsolved Mysteries is spectacular. No oh. offense to Robert Stack, but this is season three of Unsolved Mysteries. And, you know, things change. It's not, you know, the 80s and 90s anymore. They have much better production. They have, you know, sure. better research. I mean, and it's this this season three is really captivating there's a, there's a couple on there i want to cover and i'm just i'm like uh, uh, it's just that they do such a great job so if you you know want to see a really great visual okay. representation of this it's called uh the body in the bay okay but it's such a great fascinating story and one of the things i love about it is it's not that long ago hmm. we're coming up on you know in january it would be the 10 year anniversary Okay. So January 27th, Patrick Mullins, it's a Sunday, who's an avid fisherman, close to retirement, close to celebrating his 30th anniversary with his wife, who's also, he's a librarian at a local high school, okay. Palmetto High School. His wife's a librarian, Jill. They have two sons, Miles and Mason. Mm-hmm. They're like this beautiful couple. I mean, beautiful inside, you know, cool. they're good people. They're just, they're good, solid people. Cool. And he loves fishing and he saved up and got a, um, a bigger, better boat, you know, and to go fishing. Right. So okay. Patrick takes his boat out around 3 PM to go fishing. Okay. Now when he's not back by dark, his wife, Jill starts to worry and she calls, you know, the local sheriff's department and they're like, well, we'll, We'll look around, we'll, you mm-hmm. know, and she, by 11 o'clock, she's like, this is not him. This something's is going, something's going wrong. So they look, she thinks that he's got to be somewhere. He's got to be found somewhere. Mm-hmm. Two days later, his boat is found pretty far away mm-hmm. from where he put it in the water. It's in neutral. It's still running. For two days. And there's nothing on it. Nothing. No. No tackle, mm, no... Maybe some of his some items, of his gears, but okay. none of him. Okay. Nothing. And I guess they would notice that uh, his anchor is missing. Mm. A 25-pound anchor. Mm. And seven days later, oh, no. his body is found. Yeah, with the anchor? Mm-hmm. In four to six feet of water. Oh, not a lot. So shallow, yeah. Nine days after he went missing in Manatee Bay, which has some of the largest number of sharks in the water, and he is barely touched. Hmm. Whoa. Nine days later, mm-hmm. and the body. Mm-hmm. No, no, nothing's feeding on this body. They're, they interviewed in Unsolved Mysteries. It's literally mm-hmm. my least favorite part. A man said, who found him, a, a fisherman, boater. He said, when I he said it was clearly a body. And when I flipped him over, his face looked like spaghetti. That's it, though. Like his hands, which would typically mm-hmm. be the thing, you know. Can you tell, had, had the body been in there for nine days or had it, had it wasn't more fresh? How can I explain this to you and not sound terrible? I believe the entire system failed Patrick Mullins and his family. Mm. The original cause of death was listed as suicide. And you're going to be able to help me understand this because you know guns. Okay. Patrick is found with a 25 pound anchor Mm -hmm. in a very intricate rope tie around all oh, okay. it would be close to hog tying except that his hands and feet weren't behind him but it's like around the groin up the up the you know spine around the front it's a okay. very odd way to tie a rope especially if you are doing this yourself right so just the rope itself looks like somebody else did you could conceivably do it yourself they they did a lot of testing but 
you know, Patrick was a fisherman and had like a one real simple way of tying a rope. Hmm. And it wasn't that. Okay. Ask me the manner of death. What is the manner of death? Gunshot wound to the head. Okay. The the original theory is he ties him himself up with a with his anchor and shoots himself in the head and lands into the water and nothing's left on the boat. Mm-hmm. Did they find a weapon or no? No. No weapon. Okay. He's never had a gun. And he's never had this gun. They okay. did a forensic accounting of his bank and he never withdrew money. Jill handled the bills. He never withdrew enough money to buy a gun. He had no mm. uh, experience or practice and had no ownership of a gun. And there was no blood on the boat. No blood, no, no, nothing on the boat. Mm. So if you shot yourself with a shotgun in the head, which basically, from what I understand, there would have to be stippling because it would be you know, you could mm-hmm. only so far, I understand there's people who use their foot or their toe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One shoe was on, one shoe was off, but his socks were on. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, they were boat shoes, literal boat shoes okay. that could have floated off in the water. True. He didn't take one off to pull a trigger of a rifle. He didn't own mm-hmm. multiple holes in the skull, no blood on the boat, mm-hmm. never owned a gun, no evidence. He bought a gun. Huh dies of a gunshot wound to the head and his body is found huh. nine days after it goes missing seven days after his boat is found pretty far away hmm. interesting there's, huh? yeah there's there's holes here oh thank you <laughs> thank you because i am pretty angry yeah. pretty angry at the manatee county sheriff's office who said yeah it's uh it's you know suicide hmm. so he's found in four to six feet of water pretty clear water by the way um his boat's found far away there's no gun on the boat there's no blood on the boat there's never a gun found hmm. that he didn't own oh never nope huh okay would a gun in four to six feet of water? Yeah, that, that's really that's really suspect. I think because so a gun too. wouldn't. I mean, you would imagine that if you if you fired the gun, and of course you're going to drop it as soon as you fire it, right? It would land pretty close to where an anchored body would land, right? I mean, it, it can't. It's not going to float away, right? And if they were, it would be on the boat that still was running sure. and it sure. wasn't there hmm. along with no blood. No evidence of, of yeah. So you shoot it. I mean, they did a really great, in the Unsolved Mysteries episode, they did a really great, um, you know, reenactment mm-hmm. of, of a guy trying to tie himself with those specific ties. And he was like, I could do it, but it's awkward. Trying to shoot himself. Mm-hmm. But you, you know, if you shoot yourself in the head and then I guess you, I mean, I don't know that you, do you have, is there a, you would have to be like a scientist to figure out which way you were going to fall. Yeah. Well. Toward the water or toward your boat. Yeah. Oh, this is. Right. This is. This, right. This, yeah. So, so wait, there's more. Yeah. Okay. So the sheriff's department says. Finally, after his wife and sons are like, look, uh, he wasn't depressed. Mm -hmm. He was looking forward to retirement. He was going to start a small business with his brother. He and his wife are going to celebrate 30 years of marriage. They loved each Mm other. Uh, they, there's no evidence they had like, um, uh, outside, you know, relationships. No one was cheating. Mm -hmm. There was no money problems there. I mean, they just were these sweet, solid citizens, happy people with two sons and a life and Mm -hmm. careers as librarians. And he gets murdered and they were like, Hey, it's suicide. His wife and sons are like, no, it is not. They finally Mm -hmm. change the manner of death to undetermined. Okay. So they don't say suicide. They're like, it's likely suicide. And I have to say the interview with, with a representative from the Manatee County Sheriff's office was not as ugly as I thought it would be because he was um, kind of a likable lug. Like he just, you know, there was nothing about him. 
you wanted to come at him with like both fists, but he just looks kind of like a impotent spokesperson. You know what I mean? Like just kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's just like towing the company line. Mm -hmm. So an odd offshoot is that um, Patrick's brother had a very, very close friend. And this man was a family friend, but not especially close to Patrick, much more close to his brother. Like I know you are a brother Mm -hmm. and I know in high school you were friends with your brother's friends, but as you get to be adults, do you hang out with your brother's friends? No, no. I know of them. Right. uh, Yeah. Exactly. Every once in a while I'll see them, you know, when we're all out or something. Right. Or if you're, if there's a party or a family thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So Damon Crestwood was his brother's friend. He was a chef. You know, he he was this like solid friend of the family, but, you know, on the periphery, mm-hmm. you know, his brother's friend. He wasn't like super close with Patrick. Patrick had a very small, insulated, you know, he was great with the kids. Right. They loved him at the school and he loved his family. He wasn't, he was mm-hmm. a big fisherman. He wasn't out hanging out with his brother's friends, right? Yeah, sounds super wholesome. Fisherman uh-huh. librarian. Yeah. Yeah, 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 waiting for retirement to mm-hmm. enjoy the good life. Mm-hmm. So Damon starts to act extremely erratic. Hmm. He starts to have big emotional breakdowns about Patrick's death. Hmm. He would sit overlooking Manatee Bay and sob for hours. Hmm. Patrick's wife, Jill, is like, I felt it was inappropriate. He cried more than I did. Wow. Right. He then uh, joins the family for a traditional Memorial Day outing about a year and a half after Patrick is found. And he wants to go water skiing and wants his dog to go with him and ties himself in the exact. <gasps> right. Oh, no. The intricate, weird rope tie. Oh, no that Patrick was found and Patrick's brother's like, what in the hell is happening? Wow. So it comes out in all of these emotional outbursts and sobbings. It comes out with all the crying that Damon is doing meth. Okay. He loses his restaurant. He, you know, things are not going well and he is using meth. Okay. There are theories that Patrick could have come across illegal activity, Hmm. like drug runners, and was killed for that. There's theories that he could have been a good Samaritan and was going to help someone that turned out to not be good. There is a a really uncomfortable piece of information, this um, bridge, that there's too much going on that doesn't add up for this to be a suicide. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it couldn't be, you know, pirates, you know, that I'm not saying that. I think it's pretty odd Damon's behavior. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to find out that Damon dies of an overdose in 2017. Okay. Later, later. Yeah. Four years after. So he dies of an overdose. Now, after his death, the family is actually putting more work and detective work into this in the goddamn Manatee County Sheriff's Department. Hmm. They notice that there are red smears on the side of the boat, okay. red paint oh. that perhaps another boat like could have crashed. come up mm-hmm, okay. or another boat had come up beside it. Uh-huh. And ironically... Damon Crestwood's boat has a red stripe. Oh. They had asked Damon Crestwood if they could examine his boat, and he said no. After his death, his daughter agreed Hmm. and let them examine his boat. And the results are that the paint is a match for the paint on Patrick's boat, and the sheriff's department says it's too common of a paint to say. Oh, but that's suspicious still. A little bit. Yeah. 
A little, a little bit. I mean, all of the things put together, like there's over a dozen species of sharks in that bay. Mm -hmm. Um, A body that has been bleeding from a head wound. Yeah. They smell it in the water. Right. The only thing that was like torn up was his face because he was face down in the water. Not even his hands or his feet, the things they go Hmm. to first. Sure. Pretty, pretty weird. Was he kept somewhere? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm wondering. Like, was he kept somewhere before he was killed or was, or was the body, you know, was he killed and then the body was kept somewhere else and then dumped? It, to me, obviously I'm not a scientist. It sounds Mm -hmm. as if he was kept somewhere and was killed after. I don't think, even if you freeze a body, you, that is, you could throw them in the water. And that would stay, scientists, doctors could still tell that you, you know, freezer burn or something. Yeah. That you had been kept somewhere cold. Yeah. It, I mean, I don't know if they just didn't give any credence to it being anything other than suicide. And so they didn't examine him correctly. Okay. I mean, even, you know, it took the coroner, you know, finally changed his mind and said, well, you know, first it was suicide, suicide, suicide. Yeah. Everyone said it was suicide. Within, honestly, within a few days after finding his body, mm. which was interesting because it was such an odd case, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if they just didn't do enough scientific research, but it just sure. doesn't sound like, it just doesn't sound like that, <laughs> that he was in the water for nine days. Yeah. Not eaten more than just his face mm-hmm. and just hung out there. I mean, nine days in the water. Honestly, there are, I don't want to like gross anyone out, but there's some pictures, you know, that are as tastefully done as they can do for TV. Probably stills from video they, you know, took when they found him. And his body's not bloated. Huh. Like I said, one shoe's on. Right. One shoe and, and one sock. One sock is on, one shoe's missing. He didn't look like a body that's been in the water for nine days. Mm-hmm. He just didn't. Yeah, I know. And I, I mean, I just feel like he deserves better than this. Right. I feel like he deserves better than this. So one of the things I found that just kind of broke my heart in half was some students who wrote an article in um, the Bradenton Herald. Okay. And the woman who wrote it, her name is Robin Merle. And there's another woman that she speaks to another, a graduate from a different year, uh, Joe to see Walker and Robin's article is entitled, you know, it's more like a first person account. It's, it's entitled my librarian was murdered. And she said, I got a text message from a former Palmetto high school classmate telling me that our beloved librarian, Patrick Mullins was missing. Mm -hmm. His boat was discovered miles from his house and he had vanished without a trace. His body was found nine days later, floating in four to six feet of water near Emerson Point, just four miles from Palmetto High School. He had shotgun wounds to his head and a rope around his torso, through his legs, over his chest, and a 25-pound anchor on the end. Hmm. What I remember most about Mr. Mullins was his fatherly demeanor and his voice, which sounded like a great radio announcer, filling the library. Mm -hmm. There's no food or drink allowed in the library, he would say. One person per computer when all of us would huddle around one friend's computer. Jodeci Walker said, Mr. Mullins was someone who followed the rules and he made sure we did too. A medical examiner ruled that his manner of death was undetermined. Sheriff's office detectives and medical examiners thought suicide was more likely the cause of death. And at first I was going to go along with what others were saying. Suicide, I thought, wow, he was always in such good spirits, but you never know a person's circumstance outside their workplace. He was a by the book type of guy. So I questioned it a little bit, but once I saw details that came out, I knew law enforcement had failed him and his family. Oh, I start crying. There were so many things they should have looked further into. I mean, you know, at first his family, how can you wrap your head around this good, kind man that's like loved by students and you're a librarian? It's not the first thing you think, like, I love my librarian, you know? What do you think? 
when your husband is not, it's not even, you can't tell what happened. Oh, he fell, he fell off his boat. Was he pushed off his boat? Did he fall off his boat? Did, did he slip? He was fucking murdered. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I don't think it was suicide. Right. I think it was murder. Oh, here's the, here's the, he had to go under the green bridge. His, mm. his boat, the boat had to go under the green bridge. Um, there's a train bridge and it, it had camera and he couldn't have gone undetected. I don't know if it was whoever did this lucked out, huh. but you know, the, the files are corrupted and there's no other version that could be downloaded. So, I mean, I don't, all of the things, you know, the, the lack of animal scavenging, it, it's sort of unlikely that he was in the water for, you know, nine days. I have to say, uh, Unsolved Mysteries did an amazing job. They hired a forensic investigator who tried to debunk the suicide thing. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, went out on the water with someone about his size. You know, she said there was no stippling, no contact wound on the head. You got it. From how, could you shoot yourself in the skull? Well, I don't know why you would. Like, that's, right. the, <laughs> that's the part. I mean, if you're trying to awkwardly hold a shotgun to your own head, there, there's if you're trying to kill yourself, there's no reason to hold it away from your head. Like why would oh, you? Oh, you care? would probably balance it on your head, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah. Why not use your head right. as a as a right a point to yeah. hold it? That's a really good point. Like, uh, there's no reason not to. That's what I'm. Uh, like, right. Right. That's 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 the okay, curious thank part you. for me. Yeah, I don't know anything about guns, so thank you. I knew you could shine a light on. I mean, this. If you, yeah, if you're trying to hold it, you've got. You got two hands right. to try and awkwardly do a thing, but you also have that point of contact. So hold it with one hand and your head, and then trigger with the with your other hand. So that's the that's the way that would make most sense to me. Like right, I hadn't thought every, about that. Everything else would be awkward, and why right. would you do something awkward? It like. Right, if, if you're it's your last yourself, thing, like why? Yeah. Right, right. Why make it difficult on yourself? Yeah. Um, I've seen like TV shows where it's like, oh, she killed herself. You know, a husband says that. And it's like, oh, she put the shotgun on the floor and pulled the trigger with her toe, sure. which I guess you could do, but sure. that's typically not at your head. That's like at your mouth or yeah, under, you your your under your chin. Mm-hmm. Sure. So this, the fact that the side of his skull, very large holes, mm-hmm. very large holes, yeah. but no stippling, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't know enough about, yeah, I, about, I don't know fuck about shit or shit about fuck, yeah. but I feel I like this. Those, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Bragging uh-huh. again. I think it's fascinating yeah, that it's like the paint chip, you know, couldn't be eliminated as a possible source. <laughs> Yeah, I understand not being able to. You know, it's a circumstantial thing because right. the paint. It, but, but it's you know, if I know, it feels and pe- like you a, can't a thing convict people. Yeah, I know you can't convict people. Well, you can't investigate him now because he's dead. Sure, you can't. You can't convict people on circumstantial. I mean, you can. <laughs> it's just more difficult. Sure, I think if Patrick had been found in the water, and they were really unsure of the cause of death, it would have been much easier for Damon Crestwood to have kind of skated under the radar. But mm-hmm. the fact that he behaved so bizarrely, right. you know, I mean, I also am not going to give him any credence for being on meth. We heard that with Nicole's story that the serial killer oh, was on meth. You know, it's just not a good enough excuse. Well, I don't know if it's I, I I don't care for it as an excuse, but I do mm-hmm. I do see it as a a reason to do crazy stuff like, like yeah yeah it can be a predictor, but it's just not a good enough excuse. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I think I think that's one more like one more circumstantial point in that in in the direction of of Damon Crestwood. And he didn't. I mean, I don't know. It's not like Patrick would be on a boat carrying a large amount of money. Sure. You know, why would you have to kill him? Why, 
what would have been a motivator for anyone other than if he came upon something illegal? Right. Was Damon Crestwood um, running drugs for someone? You sure saw something he maybe. Shouldn't have I mean, or... that's just speculation, but you know, it just seems you know the paint when you see the pictures of the boat, it's it's a very linear it's a linear line of red paint on his, you know, white, the white part of his uh-huh. boat. It's very interesting. It doesn't look so like fresh. A, like a boat skid up yep. next to it. Yeah. Okay. You know, like how if, if someone hits you and they leave their color paint on your car, it's exactly yeah. like that. That's, that's, that's all the paint that's on my car. <laughs> other people's car at this point. <laughs> I have some nail polish I can loan you that we can touch it up. Do you, you like pink and yeah. purple? Yeah. I, I prefer rose gold. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. Yeah, yeah. I think if I were Jill, I would feel so bad. And his yeah. brother and his sons, and they're really smart, but they're being patient. And I'm I'm proud of them, and I don't know yeah. how they're doing it, except that they have a lot of support from their friends and, and the community and their church. Mm-hmm. Apparently they went to a United Methodist church. And what I loved is this picture that almost broke my heart of Jill standing at, you know, like a, um, a stand with the minister. Mm-hmm. And he said, we are coming up on the 10th anniversary of not knowing who did this to Patrick. And the thing is you can still see Jill. Uh, don't cry. You can still see Jill going around town with a staple gun, stapling posters of Patrick up almost 10 years later. I really was impressed with what Unsolved Mysteries did with this case, but I just, I have the feeling people know more Mm -hmm. and I get it. Damon isn't here anymore to to give any more information, but the fact that his daughter let them examine his boat is a pretty big deal. Right. Like that she wanted maybe some answers answered, even Mm -hmm. though her dad's not here anymore. Right. So I want to know what you tipsters think. And if you saw that episode, let me know. And maybe this is the year Jill won't have to staple any more posters around town. Yeah, let's hope. And if you have any information, please call the Manatee County Sheriff's Office at 941-747-3011. That's 941-747-3011. And more cowbell. If you would like to support this podcast and get early access and other cool murderous swag, go to patreon.com slash justthetipsters.